Hey everybody, welcome to Moderate Rebels. Ben, you're in the center of a pretty momentous situation. Uh, you're one of the few people left who can actually speak about it now on social media from a critical perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Just so people don't know, I want to talk about a horrific censorship campaign we've seen in the past few days. Today is uh, today is November 4th. On November 7th, Nicaragua has national elections. The U.S. government and European Union have repeatedly attacked the integrity of Nicaragua's elections. I can talk more about that in a bit and why those accusations are bogus or ridiculous, especially considering the U.S. government and European countries backed a brutally violent coup attempt in Nicaragua in 2018, trying to violently overthrow the democratically elected Sandinista government. But getting to what's happening this week, on November 7th, there are elections, and a few days before those elections, all of the major social media outlets, they totally just banned Sandinistas, basically. There was a massive purge of Sandinistas. It began actually with Twitter. Twitter, about 10 days before the election, Twitter started purging prominent Sandinista journalists and influencers and communicators and activists. And then a, exactly a week before the elections, on the night of Halloween, October 31st, Facebook just purged over 1,000 Sandinistas. I know that because I started getting messages from my friends here in Nicaragua, and they were saying, I, I think we've been hacked. A lot of them, were they thought they were being hacked. And I started looking, and I was like, this is not a, this is not a hacking operation. This is a purge that Basically, all of the major Sandinista media outlets, journalists and communicators and activists were purged from Facebook and Instagram as well. Of course, Facebook and Instagram are owned by the newly rebranded company Meta, M-E-T-A. And we're going to talk about that later. I know Max has he has a whole thing he wants to talk about. Meta is this like dystopian, neo-feudal, techno-feudal future that that billionaire that hundred billionaire jeff bezos wants for us or, or so rather hundred billionaire mark zuckerberg but also jeff bezos wants for us so here's the article i i published at the gray zone meet the nicaraguans facebook falsely branded bots and censored so these are photos of nicaraguans i know them all personally and i know i talked to over two dozen nicaraguans who i know Personally, I have met in flesh and blood. I know who they are. They are very much not bots. They are Sandinista supporters, but that's not a crime unless I guess now Meta is saying it's a crime. So anyway, to keep to keep going on the story. So Facebook purged over a thousand accounts on Facebook and Meta also purged numerous accounts on Instagram and not only of individual accounts, but we're also talking about media outlets, including Barricada. Barricada is the official newspaper of the Sandinista Front. So that's like MSNBC is basically the official media outlet of the DNC, of the Democratic Party. That would be like the equivalent of all of the major media, social media corporations purging MSNBC's accounts. And then Facebook in its report, which we'll talk about, was authored this report, totally bogus report, was authored by a former NATO press officer who has no background in actual technology or any of this information science. His name is Ben Nimmo. We'll talk about him in a bit. This bogus report claimed that these outlets, these media outlets and these Sandinista activists needed to be purged because they were a quote, a, a so-called troll farm run by the Nicaraguan government and the Sandinista front. Now that is totally bogus, again, because... As I showed in these interviews that I did, video interviews, these are real people. I know them personally. I'm telling you, I know who they are. They are not tr trolls. They are not bots. Second of all, after these Nicaraguans posted video on their Twitter accounts, because at first Meta purged them on Facebook and Instagram. So they went to Twitter and they started posting videos saying, Facebook purged me. I'm not a bot. Facebook published this report saying I'm a bot. I'm not a bot. Here I am. And what was the response of Twitter? Twitter then suspended their accounts. So it's so clear. This was a coordinated social media purge. It, it actually started on Twitter. And then it, it really drastically expanded on Facebook and Instagram. And then 
Twitter deleted the accounts of all of the Nicaraguans trying to prove their own existence. I mean, I, it was totally insane. And the this ultimate is, uh, of this, this is the account of Ligia Sevilla, who basically declared that she was a real person on Twitter. And so five minutes later, Twitter destroyed her account for doing so, for basically contradicting the U.S. regime's narrative. Yeah, I mean, and the ultimate irony of this is the U.S. government spent billions of dollars. Here, here it is very quickly. We should actually just play this video. Yeah, if you go have ahead. Your... Uh, I don't know if I... No yeah, the audio is up. Okay. Go to the beginning, yeah. Mi nombre es Ligia Sevilla. My name no is Ligia Sevilla. No I'm, not a bot. I'm not a troll. He has sido en and my social sociales. media accounts were censored. Acaso Facebook no nos Maybe Facebook doesn't sandinista. allow us to be Sandinistas. I, I know this, this girl. She's a young Sandinista activist. I have met her in person. I know who she is. Like... The idea that she's a bot or a troll is blatantly false. And not only did Facebook claim that, but every major media outlet just totally regurgitated Facebook's false claims. It's fake news. And every major media outlet had a headline saying Facebook takes down Nicaraguan regime's troll farm or Ortega's personal troll farm. I mean, total fake news, a blatant lie. And the point I was saying is that the U.S. government spent billions of dollars, or at least millions, many millions of dollars, investigating supposed Russian meddling in the 2016 election. And after years of investigation and all this money spent, there we go. Here's Reuters. Facebook says it removes troll farm from the government. At least this report, the headline, is slightly, slightly a little bit more balanced, even though it's still fake. But a lot of media outlets didn't even say fake Facebook says. They said Facebook removes Nicaraguan government troll farm, which is totally false. That's totally false. But any, the point I'm, I'm trying to get at here is that remember Russiagate, the U.S. government spent all this money, all these years investigating, claiming that Russia meddled in the U.S. election. What was the so-called evidence that it found? The only evidence was Facebook memes, was that supposedly this Russian company allegedly linked to the Kremlin, the IRA, the Internet, Internet Research Agency, which... I mean, again, we don't even know if it was actually the Kremlin, but we know that this group, this company in Russia, bought Facebook ads, and over half of those Facebook ads were published after the 2016 election. So only half of them became before the election that were supposedly supposed to rig the election on behalf of Donald Trump. Furthermore, most of those ads were apolitical, and some of those ads, as our colleague Aaron Mate showed, included Jesus Christ a meme of Jesus consoling young masturbation addicts about why they should beat it for Jesus or whatever. So like the U.S. government with a straight face, the FBI spent all of this time and all these resources trying to claim that Russia hacked the election on behalf of Donald Trump in a, in a quote, Pearl Harbor style attack. And the only evidence they found was Facebook memes. Meanwhile, here we are, a few days before Nicaragua's elections and Fitter, Twitter, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. here's the meme that, that the U.S. government- Jesus is comforting a chronic masturbator. This, this is the reason why Hillary Clinton lost was that Jesus comforted this guy who uh, he's really ashamed. And this compelled so many people to go out and vote you know, they were chanting, let's go Brandon left and right after they saw this ad. It was just, it was over. But yeah, so it was a huge joke. But I mean, I think you should mention, Ben, um, that one of the guys who was brought in in this gigantic Russiagate grift uh, and got tons of money to go after the so-called Russian bots and Russian troll farms was Ben Nimmo, the same person who's now been brought in by Facebook to take down all these accounts. As you mentioned, he's a former NATO press officer. Before that, he wrote for like a fishing magazine or, you know, he was a travel writer. He has no experience in data. He's just a, a basically imperial publicist and he oversees these operations. He went to work for Graphica, which is funded by Pentagon, the Pentagon's Minerva Institute, the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, which is basically an arm of the CIA. And now, I mean, we can talk all day about him and all of the frauds that he's been behind. But during Russiagate, he was identifying real people as bots too, like the Ukrainian concert pianist um, Valisitsa. She has a pretty big Twitter account. 
She's Ukrainian, but she's not on the side of the Kiev NATO backed government. So he identified her as a troll and momentarily had her account removed. This other guy, uh, Ian, who is a pensioner in the UK, had his account removed. And then he came out on Sky News and was like, I'm a real person. He was interviewed on Sky News and they were asking him like, are you affiliated with Russia? And he said, no, I'm just, I mean, the video, we could bring it up. It's incredible. But he did what Ligia Sevilla did. He said, no, I'm a real person. And I'm just disgusted with the neocons who've taken over our government. And so you think I'm a Russian troll. It was, it was like the greatest kind of have you no shame moment of Russiagate. But this is what Ben Nimmo is responsible for. And now here he is again, totally shameless. And the whole mainstream media doesn't even acknowledge, <coughs> sorry, that Ben Nimmo himself worked for a troll farm called the Integrity Initiative, a UK in military intelligence operation called the Integrity Initiative. He was secretly being paid through a fake think tank called the Institute of Statecraft to help them create these clusters of journalists and foment a new Cold War narrative in the UK to drive up military budgets. I mean, this guy is a straight up neocon operative, a state operative. It's not Facebook acting on its own here. And the, the political consequences are enormous in Nicaragua. This is part of a US information warfare attack on Nicaragua. And that's where I think you should you should pick up Ben there on what 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 the motives behind this were ahead of the election and what the effect will be on the ground in a country where the U.S. has been attempting regime change for years. Well, it's very clear the U.S. backed a violent coup attempt in Nicaragua in 2018, as we've often talked about and reported on. And at the, in that time as well, what happened? There was a massive coordinated social media purge of Sandinistas. In fact, some of the friends I know who had their accounts purged last week, who I've talked to in person, I know, again, these are real people, I know them, that this is the second or third or even fourth time that they've been purged. And of course, in 2018, they were purged during the coup attempt, and they were providing an important perspective showing what was actually happening on the ground, that this was a violent coup attempt in which U.S. government backed basically fascists, these, these far-right extremists were erecting these bloody barricades called tranques, taking over communities, take, wrestling them away from the government and the state and running these personal fiefdoms as like these, these warlords. And then they were just all like doing drugs and getting drunk and, and brutalizing civilians in the communities. And then they were hunting down, literally hunting down Sandinista activists and supporters. They had WhatsApp groups and, and other social media groups spreading around photos of Sandinista activists. I have friends, I know people who had their photos sent around, their addresses doxed, their phone numbers doxed, and they were threatened to be killed. There were Sandinistas who were killed, who were tortured. There were houses burnt down, houses marked. This is like biblical stuff where, where the, the fascists would go mark the houses of Sandinistas. And while this was happening, the big social media corporations, which are basically basically arms of the U.S. government, they did a systematic purge of Sandinistas so they could not expose what was actually happening. So the only information or disinformation, rather, that people would have access to about Nicaragua would be the right wing opposition backed by the U.S. or the major corporate media outlets. And here you can see this is this is reporting that that Max did on the ground during the coup attempt. The purge was then in 2018 was an attempt to control the narrative to prevent Nicaraguans from being able to share their own experiences and dispel the lies in the media. And that's exactly what's happening right now. This is the home the of a, a, a member, a council member in Messiah it was completely burned down and trashed by US backed opposition gangs in 2018. So as Ben's explaining, the purge is an extension of this campaign. Well, and, and now the latest purge is before the November 7th election. So now, most of the major Sandinista journalists, influencers, communicators, media outlets, and activists have all been erased from the internet. So they're not going to be able to challenge the corporate media narrative, which is just fed by the U.S. government. And it, they're going to say that the election was supposedly illegitimate, that supposedly it's a dictatorship, that supposedly Nicaraguans don't support the government. All complete lies. And now average Nicaraguans don't they're not going to be able to challenge that narrative. And of course, this is also a way of discouraging voter turnout, which is the U.S. is telling its 
puppets in Nicaragua to, to boycott the election, to not participate, just as the U.S. did the same thing in 2018 in the Venezuelan election. The U.S. forced its puppets like Voluntad Popular, the party of Juan Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez, and other right-wing parties to boycott the election, and they did so. So another, another point I want to get at is looking at the actual details of this so-called report. Because if you even take a critical eye in any way to this report, which of course no one in the mainstream media reporting on this actually did, they didn't read Facebook's or Meta's so-called report. If you read it, it immediately falls apart with, with five seconds of just critical scrutiny. So here are the, the main points of this report. They removed 937 Facebook accounts, 363 Instagram accounts, 140 Facebook pages, 24 groups, all of them pro Sandinista. And that might not seem like a lot, but Nicaragua only has a population of 6.5 million people. It's smaller than basically all U.S. states. This is a very small country. So purging all of the major Sandinista journalists and influencers a few days before the election can actually have a tangible impact on the election results. That's actual election meddling. But anyway, here's here's the so-called report. This is an 11-page report published by Ben Nimmo, the NATO press officer with no actual expert background. So here, there's a few points I want to raise from this. Here's a graph that Ben Nimmo published. And this graph is incredible. If you, if you took a statistics, a statistics class in college and you gave this report to your statistics professor, they would fail you. Now, look at this, look at this graph. They say that the supposed troll operations shift pattern from Monday through Sunday to Managua time. Note the late morning spike in activity, the drop in the middle of the day, and the significantly reduced volume of posting at weekends. There's two things you want to point about this. First of all, this is what all of Twitter looks like and all of Facebook looks like. When people are awake in the morning, they wake up and get on social media to see the news and they post. When they're working through the day, they post less. And then at night, when they're hanging out with their friends or family members or watching TV or whatever, they don't post. That is like, that's everyone in the entire world. This is how social media works. And second of all, a skeleton where, crew on weekends. They have a skeleton. Second of all, where, where's the axis? What is the Y axis? There's no Y axis. L look at this graph. All it has is the hours at the bottom and there's no Y axis. What is this graph? There's nothing there. Like if you, your statistics professor would fail you, this is not a real graph. All it has is a bunch of tweets based on, all right, who, who is, tw who is tweeting or posting on Facebook at 4 a.m. Like very few people are posting at 4 or 5 a.m. Obviously, it's going to be dead at that hour. And then obviously when people wake up in the morning, I mean, I'm probably a social media addict, but unfortunately a lot of people are social media addicts. And what we do, one of the first things we do in the morning is we wake up and we check social media. And that's if you took this graph, which has no y-axis, so it means nothing. It's not a real graph. But if you took it in any country in the world, you could say this shows a so-called troll operation in, in Maryland, in Virginia, in California, in Russia, in China, in Venezuela, well, in Ethiopia, in Israel. Like I think, I think there is a cultural component here that Ben Nimmo doesn't quite understand. A lot of these, these, these data people and these tech people, they don't understand when people actually lead uh, what we could call a traditional lifestyle where they wake yeah. up in the morning and then go to lunch and like have like regimented social activities or, or families because they exist in the metaverse and Ben Nimmo, he doesn't, he, he is uh, conflating people who lead ordinary uh, what we would call ordinary lifestyles or maybe even healthy lifestyles with robots <laughs> uh, when in fact he's the robot just because he's always on a computer all day. Well, so, and, and the lack of human touch there. <laughs> good point. And then another thing about this is look at this. He says, this is what he writes here. He said, the network was densely interwoven with the government's official communications infrastructure. What he's saying is People that- People go to work at newspapers. <laughs> well, no, he's saying that, <laughs> that you saw that so-called trolls, that is average Nicaraguans who support the Sandinista front would retweet government accounts. 
they would retweet state media accounts or government officials, which that's what every country does. It, when liberals, when Democrat partisans retweet Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Anthony Blinken, that doesn't mean that they're bots. It means that they support the government. They support the Democratic Party and they're retweeting them. But they're saying there were technical overlaps between the so-called troll operation and official pages representing various branches of government and the FSLN party. So think about in the U.S., if you're a Democrat operative, if you're so you support the Democratic Party, you don't you're not a troll, but you're like a, a blue, like a blue state, like pussy hat wearing whatever. And you love the Democrats and you retweet DNC accounts on the Democratic Party. Then according to this logic, according to Facebook's fake expert, you are a troll of the DNC. That's the well, logic they're saying. The if DNC, you retweet the, the Sandinista was, party, you're a troll of the DNC. We should mention that the or DNC the has run actual troll farms like Sally Albright's troll farm. And that if you look at analysis of the influencers that circulated around this troll farm, they, in January 2017, got a major bump on Twitter where all of a sudden they, these like Rick Wilson characters who's with the Lincoln Project were totally ignored before. And then all of a sudden Trump comes in and they get this massive meteoric spike in the amount of likes and retweets they get. It was like anytime Rick Wilson or Joy Reid farted or coughed, it would get like 7,000 likes. I remember the day John Brennan joined Twitter, he got 88,000 likes for calling the Trump administration, a cacistocracy, as if anyone knows or cares what that word means. And somehow John Brennan captivated Twitter with this one tweet. So it's obvious that there are troll farms out there. There are right-wing troll farms. You wrote about CLS strategies, Ben, run by Obama's top Latin American hand, Mark Firestein, which was running troll farms against Venezuela's elected government, against Bolivia's elected government on behalf of the right. And they're just you know, they're operating on K Street totally free to do whatever they want. Well, and even the OAS, the U.S. controlled organization of American states that helped carry out the coup in Bolivia in 2019, even the OAS later admitted that there were tens of thousands of actual trolls of fake accounts and bots created in the immediate days before, during, and after the coup in Bolivia to spread fake news. And by the way, I want to point out that right now, Constantly, I'm being trolled by fake accounts, by bots on Twitter in Nic who claim to be in Nicaragua. And all of these accounts, they all have the name like they have like Sergio and eight numbers, Juan and eight numbers, like Bandalico, eight numbers. You know, like they're all these fake accounts and they were all created in November or October. Like there's tons of these actual troll accounts. They're right wing bots and they're constantly trolling me and calling me a sapo, which is like an insult they use. And saying that I'm paid by the dictatorship and all this nonsense. There's actual trolls going on. But of course, those are trolls that support the right-wing opposition and the U.S. government position. But really quickly, I don't want to belabor it too much, but I want to get back to this bogus report written by Ben Nimmo. Because again, none of the so-called journalists writing about this purge actually read this report to see how many bogus claims are in this report. How many, it's like Swiss cheese. There are so many holes in this. Look at this. All right, here's another one. He he points out that there's this blog called Molotov, Molotov Digital, Digital Molotov. I know the people who run this blog. I it's think a Scott bunch, Walker it's, called it Mazel Tov Digital. But <laughs> anyway. it's, it's just a Sandinista blog run by Sandinista activists who support the government. Look at this blog. Do you think that the, that the Nicaraguan government spent lots of resources making a blog spot website? No. <laughs> I mean, this is like a very poorly run website run by working class Sandinista militants. And they said their proof that it's supposedly part of a, of, of a troll operation is that the website highlights the links to its social media accounts and that its social media accounts retweeted the government. I know the people who run this website. This is not the government run media. I'll show you what a government run media outlet. There, there are state media outlets. Now, there's one called Diecinueve Digital. This is an official state media outlet run by the Nicaraguan government, which every government in the world has. You, the U.S. is VOA, Voice of America. This is what actual state media looks like in Nicaragua. It is much more professional. 
it is a much bigger operation than Molotov Digital, which is it's a small blog run by a few Sandinista activists. Like, why would the Sandinista government need to run a blogspot website when it has its its own state media, El 19 Digital, right in front of me, that is much better run, a much better operation, much more professional. Like Ben Nimmo made this up. He is a complete fraud. I'm saying this to his face right now. Ben Nimmo is a fraud. <laughs> Everything about this report is completely bogus. There's there's nothing real about this. They, and finally, the last thing I want to say about this ridiculous well, before Here's we go to that uh, Max, mail. Here's male model Ben Nimmo. Um, Wait, Max, the, I want to. I'm going to take this. The okay, last thing I want to okay, say about uh, this, just to give everyone a look at Ben Nimmo. All right. Well, we'll talk enough. about him in a second. I just want to point out because people say that's ad hominem. You can say that he's a U.S. government operative, but what about the report? He said, "What about the facts?" There are no facts in this report. Look at this. Look at this. This is for me the most mind blowing admission in this bogus report. He says that. That the supposed troll farm spent a grand whopping total of twelve thousand dollars in spending for ads on Facebook and Instagram. Twelve thousand dollars, which is like what the U.S. government spends in five seconds on social media ads. And but but look at this important phrase he uses here. Ben Nimmo admits that this includes the entirety of historic advertising activity by both inauthentic and authentic accounts removed as part of this network he's admitting that he purged real people authentic accounts and i know these people some of them are friends of mine i know who they are like these are people who go out and like go drink and party on friday nights and like they're real people like they support the sandinista front but they're the authentic accounts who were purged by ben nimmo now in this 11 page report he never distinguishes how he knows the difference between inauthentic and authentic accounts. He admits that Facebook purged authentic people, but they never acknowledge who those authentic people are because all this was is a this is a massive purge of Sandinistas. That's what it was. They're blatantly admitting it here by authentic accounts. Well, they're so trying they're saying to deny that you can't be a Sandinista and you can't support the Sandinista government. And if you are a supporter of the Sandinista government, then we're going to purge you, suspend you several days before the election. The, the master narrative is that Daniel Ortega has no base of support and that he has to create fake bot armies in order to create the appearance of support. And then the, the AP uh, said stated that anyone who speaks out against Ortega is immediately jailed, which is totally false and, and misrepresents what's going on in Nicaragua, where opposition figures have been detained for their role in 2018, where hundreds of people were killed and they were on the payroll of U.S. intelligence, just straight up, were involved in violent activities or in collaborating with the U.S. to impose sanctions on Nicaragua. But the point of this report and the way that it's been covered is to create the impression that Ortega is not the appointed representative or elected representative, not only of a country, but of a two million strong workers movement, one of the largest in the Western Hemisphere, that's the Sandinista Front, that he's someone who just pets a cat uh, while he's like <laughs> fielding phone calls with Bashar al-Assad and the ghost and of Putin. Gaddafi uh, alone in his evil uh, dictator cave and then shooting peaceful protesters through like some paid mercenaries. And, you know, and you the irony is that way more people are killed on a weekly basis. Or uh, let me say this. Way more people are killed every year in Honduras, the neighbor of... Of Nicaragua, then were then were killed at the peak of the coup attempt. Dur throughout all of the coup attempt, unfortunately, there were about three hundred people killed, and and over and over half of them were Sandinistas, by the way. But three hundred around three hundred people were killed in the coup attempt, and Nicaragua was a very peaceful country. Meanwhile, neighboring Honduras, which is basically a neo colony of the U.S., had one of the highest murder rates in the entire world, and there are way more people killed in Honduras every year than during well, the coup attempt in Nicaragua. Nicaragua is one of the least, has, has some of the lowest rates of violent crime and murders, especially uh, by firearms in the Western Hemisphere, but certainly in Latin America. I mean, it's a completely different atmosphere than the Northern Triangle Central American countries, as Ben said. You can walk around anywhere and, you know, if someone's going to come at you, you know, you could probably, if you can defend yourself with your fists, you'll probably be good. Uh, 
because there just aren't guns everywhere like you see in El Salvador or Honduras. Uh, the other thing that you'll see in Nicaragua is just people flying Sandinista flags in front of their homes, on their cars, everywhere. Uh, there's just enormous support for the Sandinistas. And you'll just get that in your daily life. And so what they're calling a troll farm is actually uh, a real farm because these are many of them are farmers. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and what the U.S. wants to do is take down the real farms. Seriously, Nicaragua has like 70 percent 80 percent food sovereign no it's over 90 over 90 over 90 i mean this is a a uh, you could call it like a self-defense mechanism or a, a weapon against sanctions that it's almost in some ways it's sanctions proof because of that economy they at least can't be starved venezuela produces a lot less of its own food and has had a tougher time under sanctions so eliminate and, and by that. the way yesterday november 3rd the, the U.S. House just voted overwhelmingly to impose new sanctions on Nicaragua through the so-called Reina Ser Act. The vote was 387 for more sanctions on Nicaragua and 35 against. To be a little fair, I'm usually very critical of the squad. To give a little credit to the squad, they did vote against the sanctions on Nicaragua. And the majority of the Democratic Party did vote for the sanctions on Nicaragua. And again, this is four days before the election that they passed these new sanctions. Talk about election meddling. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, and the sanctions aim to destroy Nicaragua's sovereignty by targeting in its economy. Uh, and then, you know, Bill Gates will come in and buy up all the farms. I mean, it, it, it's, <laughs> it has a very sovereign economy. The Sandinista government has provided micro loans to farmers to uh, get their own business started. Um, most of these microloans went to women. So Nicaragua has one of the highest rates of female participation at every level in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Nicaragua took special measures to protect its informal workers, uh, people working in the informal economy during the pandemic, whereas you, know, you saw countries that don't have sovereignty like Honduras or Guatemala uh, putting everyone under really crushing lockdowns following you know, WHO guidance. And uh, people are rewarding them for that. People reward them for building roads. People are rewarding them for um, building new health clinics. You see health clinics going up everywhere in the cities and the countryside. I mean, you'll have people tell, and, and I was there in Nicaragua during the neoliberal period before Ortega was voted in in 2006. And it really was shocking to see the amount of deprivation outside the capital of Managua um, and, and, the, and, and to see the transformation. So one, one, one second, I want to yeah. point out here really quickly that speaking of hospitals, this is a huge, this is a huge detail that people don't think about a lot in rich industrialized countries in the global North, that Central America is one of the poorest regions of the entire world. And that Central America is, has a huge problem with the lack of access to hospitals. And ever since the Sandinistas came back in 2007, they have been skyrocketing the the new the creation of new hospitals and health clinics here here's a map right here it shows the 228 hospitals built in the past eight years in central america and 77 were in nicaragua and look at neighboring honduras 31 el salvador 29 guatemala 44 panama 18 Panama is actually quite in the context of, of Central America. Panama is the, the richest country in Central America. And they built 18, whereas Nicaragua built 77. So or, I'm sorry, this is the total number of hospitals. Nicaragua has built 20, built 20 public hospitals. This is the total number of hospitals. Pardon me for that, that correction there. They built 14. So Nicaragua has over nearly four times as many hospitals as Panama twice as many hospitals as Honduras. And in Nicaragua, all medical attention is free. I know friends who, a friend of mine, his mom had cancer and she got chemotherapy, 30 sessions of chemotherapy and didn't pay a single cent. Whereas in the US, the great beacon of freedom and democracy, the most common form of bankruptcy in the US is medical expenses. And the most common reason for bankruptcy due to medical expenses is due to cancer treatment. So we're talking about the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti providing free, high-quality 
healthcare at all levels, building dozens of new hospitals, having more hospitals than any other country in Central America. And then people say, I don't get why they support the so-called dictator. He's not a dictator. He's elected. Yes, this is going to be, or this is Ortega's fourth term. That's true. But in some ways, term limits can be anti-democratic if people support their president and want to have their president back. And as we see in the US, there are a lot of liberals who worship Obama and who said they wish they could vote Obama for a third term. And in some ways, like as much instead, as I hate they Obama, have, they, they instead they had to have a third term through a guy who can barely even knows where he is. I mean, exactly. Obama's so, still pulling the strings. We're supposed to believe that Nicaraguans either one, the propaganda, it's contradictory. There's two talking points. One, that Nicaraguans are all forced into submission. They're beaten down by a supposed police state. And by the way, there's way fewer police in the streets in Nicaragua than in the U.S. Every time I return to the U.S., especially in New York, I'm reminded of how, how much of a police state it is and how many cops there are in every corner. But anyway, we're supposed to believe that simultaneously Nicaraguans are beaten down by a supposed police state. And that's why Ortega is still in power. Or the other propaganda point is that Nicaraguans are all too stupid and too ignorant that they're supposedly bribed to vote for the Sandinistas. And, and we're supposed to believe that there's no genuine support. But the reality is that there's a lot of genuine support. Polls consistently show around two thirds of Sandinistas, uh, two thirds of Nicaraguans, not 100%, not 90%, around 65% of, of Nicaraguans support the Sandinista front and support Ortega because he brought free education, free healthcare, job programs, public housing, all these programs, which you're never allowed to talk about. And if you're a Nicaraguan and you go on social media and you tweet about it and you share government media, well, then you're going to be purged for supposedly being a troll. Yeah. If you, if you support any of those things, you're uh, on a troll farm and then you can be disappeared. So uh, I think that's one aspect of Facebook that was also detailed in a sort of stunning way by the fake whistleblower, Frances Haugen, who Alex Rubenstein profiled for us at the gray zone when she talked about their threat intelligence division uh, and counter espionage group. I had no idea such a thing existed within Facebook. It turns out Ben Nimmo is a big part of that. And Facebook has hired ex spies. I mean, who they're not really ex spies. They're just not t technically affiliated with the CIA or uh, military intelligence or wherever they work, but Facebook is essentially an arm of U.S. information warfare, as we can see, as well as the surveillance state. And Francis Haugen's testimony was focused entirely on designated enemy states, including now Ethiopia, which is facing a huge offensive by a force that the U.S. appears to support. So it was clear where her testimony was going. And I think I see this purge in light of her testimony. And I also see the rebranding of Facebook as part of a wider and really disturbing trend where if you understand how Facebook was born as a surveillance tool, how it's used by the police to uh, arrest, for example, uh, young black men in cities based on Facebook posts bit, where they state uh, their intention to you know, have a conflict with another individual. There are tons of arrests take place because of Facebook uh, raids. Uh, we wrote about, uh, Jeremy Lofredo and I wrote at the Gray Zone about a military intelligence think tank in Northern Virginia called MITRE, spelled M-I-T-R-E, which developed for the FBI a technology that can actually capture your fingerprints off of social media. So if I just go like that, my fingerprints are captured. This is a real thing. So to understand and recognize the surveillance capacity of Facebook and other social media networks, and then to consider that we're moving from the internet of things into the internet of bodies should really disturb everyone. And this is an aspect of, of the, the Facebook rebranding that needs to be more thoroughly assessed Meta is not really the rebranding of Facebook because Facebook has been getting so much bad press. Meta is something that Facebook had had in the works for a while because of the advent of the Internet of Bodies, where we will actually experience the Internet as reality. Virtual reality will be the future of the Internet. And so this isn't a rebranding. It's just a new stage 
of the internet experience where our entire lives can be jammed into a virtual experience that includes our sex lives, especially if you, you know, are into like weird stuff, you probably have trouble finding sex partners. Well, you can find it in the metaverse that could include our schooling in-person learning suffered a huge blow last year with lockdowns. And so that and all these social distancing measures normalized the kind of uh, stay at home experience. Schooling is being pushed into the metaverse at uh, office working, you know, you can go to the office or go to a board meeting in this virtual world and everything you do, including your activist meeting can and will be surveilled. There will be no private space, which means our social movements are pretty much in peril. Let's, let me throw up a video of uh, Zuckerberg's first introduction of the metaverse. It's pretty insane. Here we go. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. See, he's at home. He's right. got a really nice Perfect. home, but most people don't have homes like that, so they might want to escape. Oh, hey, Wait, can, can you can you pause it for a second? This might be really dumb. Can you just go back for a second? Is this might be a dumb point? I just want to make fun of yeah, Zuckerberg because aware. he's, I mean, he's like a human cartoon character. And right there, pause it, pause it. Someone pointed out. I forgot who pointed this out, but. People remember when he was tes testifying, when Zuck was testifying in the U.S. Congress and people were like, why does his haircut look like he's a four year old who tried to cut his hair with scissors? And it, it looks so weird. <laughs> like he and used a Froby. And then you look at the cartoon character version of him and it's like, oh, I think Zuck looks in a mirror and he sees a cartoon character like he has already been living in his own metaverse. And that's he wants to look like his own cartoon character. It's like this weird psycho psychoanalytical yeah. Freudian thing, or I don't even know. It's really it's strange. very meta. <laughs> and he's like, he just assumes that everyone wants to be like an online cartoon character living in the metaverse, just like he does. Yeah, right. Because he's and he's clearly deeply uncomfortable being in public. He's extremely neurotic. He's kind of uh, shut in. So this is the perfect place for him. And then he thinks everyone else must want it. So. Yeah, he's in his Hawaiian uh, All right. Perfect. house, Man McMansion, and now he's at, at the board oh, meeting hey, and everyone's friendly Hi, and Mark. happy. Whoa, we're floating in space. We're floating. Huh? We, we don't even place. have to awesome. experience right? gravity this anymore. This is the crater. I met in L.A. Uh, this place is amazing. <laughs> Boss, is that you? Of course it's me. This, you know I had to be the robot, man. I thought this I was place is so much robot. better than my ex-urban <laughs> hovel that oh. I'm about to get evicted from. Yep. I knew you were bluffing. <laughs> hey, wait. Where is Naomi? Wow, Let's I have a her. robot Naomi. friend. <laughs> hey, should we deal you in? Sorry, I'm running late, but you've got to see what we're checking out. There's an artist going around Soho hiding AR pieces for people to find. <laughs> oh, my God. Pretty street art. That's cool. Send that link over so we can all look at it. Wow, street Ooh, art. Cool. Wow, street art inside That's here. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, it's I like Pokemon Wait, Go, it's, but it's uglier. This is amazing. Hold on. I'll tip the artist and they'll extend it. Wow. Brilliant. I'll so tip the can... artist. So she's talking about the exchange of uh, digital currency there, tipping the artist. Central bank digital currency is, you know, another aspect of this where your currency is linked to your identity and controlled by central banks. So essentially without any cash, you could easily be cut off or kind of sanctioned for any reason. Well, Here, and Facebook, people, pause for a second. People forget that Facebook already launched its own digital currency. Right. I think it's called the DM. And now this is, I mean, no one cared about it. I, I don't think anyone really invested in it, but now this is going to be their way to try to get people to actually buy their stupid digital currency is by doing all this stuff. So it's like, it's, I mean, I guess all currency is kind of fake, but most currencies are backed by states. But Facebook, this corporation, which is trying to make its own like state within technology to control people, is going to issue its own currency. I mean, it's it really is like techno feudalism, where they they do it. Facebook's going to do all the things that a state does, but it's controlled by a billionaire, right? And with 
and uh, cash will be outmoded. So those who rely on cash, people who are called unbanked, become surplus humanity. That includes the homeless population of US, the poor, older people, people who work in the informal economy around the world, which is actually the majority or close to the majority in the global South, and uh, people who engage in activity that's considered illegal, which could even be activism. So it's further securitization of every aspect of our life. Another room that you're gonna love. Check out this forest room. Check out, the, you're gonna oh, love this. This guy's Koi really, the this, this robot yeah, lobster. Weird. This is, wild. I don't wanna be friends with him. <laughs> hey, one sec, Boz, it's Priscilla. Hey, you have to see this. Beast is going crazy. Oh, I love Beast. that guy. I love that guy. Do you, wait, we got to hear him say that again. He doesn't love anything. He doesn't know. He doesn't have any experience of. This is where they're trying to humanize him. Hey, yeah. Oh, he has a dog. That's his crazy. wife, I think. Yeah. Oh, he has a dog. Oh, my God. Oh, I love that guy. Oh, show that to the kids. He, look at he how bland his dad. lawn is in his yard. Him. All right. See you at home. This place is great, Boz, but there's something I got to get back to. All right. So that's a glimpse of a few ways that we're going to be able to get together and socialize in the metaverse. Okay. Honestly, the I think the like he Mark Zuckerberg might be the first human being where the cartoon version of him looks more like him than the real version of him. Because you look yeah. at him, he just he looks like just like a white wall. He looks like cardboard. I mean, <laughs> he's he he's made himself try to look like a character, a cartoon character as much as possible. Yeah, I, I tried to make an avatar on my iPhone of myself, and it just wasn't that realistic. Maybe because I just look strange or my face is too incongruous but zuckerberg really i mean it's he's almost like uh, the avatar stepped into reality um but deeply well, disturbing I, I wanted to play i, I do want you that. to yeah i do want you to be able i think you should keep going and riffing on this because there's so much good stuff to say unfortunately say unfortunately I, I do have to run for an interview um on nicaragua no, i gotta but, run too i just wanted to throw that up there but uh well, i, I want to make a Zuckerberg being neurotic, but go ahead. Well, ben. you should you should keep going, but I'm gonna I want to make a final point before I have to run here about Facebook and its merging, Meta's merger with the U.S. government. So this is the report I did on the Nicaraguans purged for daring to be Sandinistas. But there's there's a part here of the article that you were getting at earlier about Ben Nimmo, and it shows how much the U.S. government has not just really penetrated, but really merged with Meta with Facebook. And we talked about how Ben Nimmo, who is the leader of Meta's so-called threat intelligence team, is a former press officer for NATO. He also worked with an actual troll farm, the British government and NATO-backed Integrity Initiative. And as you mentioned, he was head of investigations for Graphica, which is backed by the Pentagon's Minerva Institute and DARPA, which, as our friend Yasha Levine has shown in, in his journalism, was actually what created the internet and a lot of big tech technology. But to the extent that people know who Ben Nimmo is, they probably know that, that Ben Nimmo is basically a U.S. deep state operative, an intelligence-linked, Pentagon-backed operative. But I wanted to point out that he's not the only one, that Facebook's entire so-called security and intelligence team was basically farmed out by the U.S. government. So and this was made patently obvious by the people who shared this totally bogus report on supposed Nicaraguan trolls. This guy right here, Nathaniel Gleitscher, Gleitscher or whatever, he shared this report falsely claiming that the Nicaraguan Sandinistas purged were government trolls. Now, who is this guy, Nathaniel Gleitscher? He is the head of security policy at Facebook. But what did he do before fa Facebook? He was at the White House National Security Council where he was director for cybersecurity. And then before that, he did he did tech stuff at the DOJ. So this is a guy who, where did Facebook find this guy? They found him because he was the cybersecurity policy head for the White House National Security Council. He's not the only one. His colleague, who is Facebook's so-called director of threat disruption, David Agr Agranovich, da David Agranovich, he also <laughs> what was kind of from, a title is that yeah exactly director of threat disruption he was also hired because he was part of the white house national security council where he was director of intelligence so this is a clear example of how facebook farmed out its security team 
from these spooks, from these guys who worked for the National Security Council on tech, that is on censorship, and who worked for a bunch of different U.S. government agencies and neoconservative think tanks. Here is the, the LinkedIn account of the head of security policy at Facebook. He also worked at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is like the king neocon think tank in D.C., funded by Western governments, funded by the arms industry, and run by Kagan, Robert Kagan, like the main, the king, the art neocon. And then before that, he was also at the National Security Council and the DOJ. This is the guy running Facebook security team. So not only is this dystopian, like neo-techno-feudal metaverse reality that we're facing, not only is it already scary enough, but it's basically just going to be run by the U.S. government. I mean, I think that's the point to make there is that Facebook's so-called intelligence and security team or Meta's intelligence and security team, they're all just U.S. government operatives. And I mean, you should keep going here. There's there's a, a bit more to say, but unfortunately, I have to run. I, I got to run too. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, thanks to Ben for the report from Nicaragua. We're going to be following up. Uh, I think the election is on November 7th, which I think is Sunday. So we'll be following up the day after uh, with Ben and we'll see what happens down there. Um, and Stella Morris told you how you can support Julian Assange. So uh, follow us next week. And thanks, everybody, for all your comments. Um, but, yeah, we'll be back next week. Peace. <laughs>